Welcome to the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy at Brown University. I'm Richard Arenberg, visiting professor of the practice of political science and a senior fellow at the Watson Institute. I'm honored to serve this year as interim director of the Taubman Center, which is a part of the Watson Institute. Tonight, we present the annual John Hazen White Senior Lecture. The John Hazen White Senior Lecture was endowed in 1993 in memory of John Hazen White Senior, a prominent Rhode Island business leader whose family company, Taco, is currently run by his son, John Hazen White Jr. The White Lecture addresses timely political and policy issues facing the nation. We're extremely grateful that in addition to the yearly lecture, the John Hayes and White program supports multiple public policy internships for Brown University undergraduates. The Hayes and White program provides rewarding opportunities for our students to experience public service and apply public policy outside of their classroom training. Now, welcome tonight to the many Brown students, faculty, alumni, and other interested citizens joining us virtually. The Taubman Center seeks to influence American politics and policy through scholarship, public opinion polling, conferences, workshops, academic research, internships, and a robust series of speakers drawn from experts, the media, academia, think tanks, and public officials. The Taubman Center for several years has focused its efforts on three themes, the pursuit of security, the cost of living, and challenges to our democracy in America. This year, we're placing special emphasis on the national elections, its aftermath, and the subsequent consequences as the nation grapples with issues of social justice, public health, education, the economy, and commitment to the rule of law. We have, an, uh, we have organized a roster of outstanding speakers and programs. Tonight, we present the 11th in our series of election-related events. We're honored to have as our guest and the John Hazen White Senior Lecturer, Laura Dove, the former Secretary of the Majority of the United States Senate. Pivotal moments in recent history have unfolded on the Senate floor from the confirmation battles over the Gorsuch, Kavanaugh and Barrett nominations to the transformation of the tax code, the response to the global pandemic and the epic clash over repealing the Affordable Care Act. Some people call it the world's greatest deliberative body while others dismiss uh, the recent Senate as a legislative graveyard, the place where progressive policy ideas go to die. With a new administration in Washington and the start of the 107th Congress in January, we'll, we are still uncertain which party will be the majority in the Senate. Whichever party leads the Senate, it will be closely divided. We could have no speaker tonight with greater experience, expertise, and insight than Laura Dove. She's able to shed light on the challenges, weaknesses, and strengths, and the personalities of the US Senate. Laura was elected secretary for the minority in August of 2013. She was then elected secretary for the majority in January of 2015 the last in a string of positions on the Senate Republican floor staff that she held. Laura began her Senate career as a page for Senator Strom Thurmond and later as a floor page for then Republican leader, Bob Dole. After several stints in the Republican cloakroom and other leadership offices, Dove was appointed Assistant Secretary for the majority in 2003 and worked on the floor as assistant secretary 
for Republican leaders Bill Frist and Mitch McConnell. She has a BA from the University of North Carolina and a master's from the University of Virginia. For those of us who love the Senate, Laura is a kindred spirit who has more than paid her dues with her commitment and dedication to what we call, sometimes with a little touch of irony, the world's greatest deliberative body. Her dad, the parliamentarian emeritus of the Senate and co-author of my filibuster book, frequently observed, quote, you may love the Senate, but the Senate may not love you back. Laura, however, was admired and respected by senators and staffers in the Senate on both sides of the aisle. The Senate did love her back. My conversation with Laura tonight will last approximately 30 minutes, after which we'll take questions from the audience. You may enter questions through the Q&A box on Zoom, which will be viewable to me. You may begin entering questions if you have them already, beginning now and throughout the program. Please keep them short and to the point. I will convey as many of these questions to Laura as we have time for. This event is being recorded for later viewing, available on the Taubman Center website or the Watson Institute website. Now, it is a great honor for me to introduce to you Laura Dove. Welcome to Brown, Laura. It's great to see you again. It is so nice to see you. I wish I was in Providence with you, but. Well, maybe, maybe sometime in the future, we can do it again and do it for real. We will defer that dream, yes. I'm very struck by your um, note that this lecture series is sponsored by someone who really cared about public service outside the classroom. Yes. Um, I supervised the Senate page program, started as a Senate page. So public service outside the classroom, I really think it has a transformative effect. So I encourage all students who are watching <laughs> to take that to heart. Well, good. That's, that's a great way to open, actually. Uh, the, uh, I want to ask you a, a, about the, the uh, current situation in the Senate a little bit. The election has left us with a unique circumstance, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, unique in the Senate's history. When it convenes on January 3rd, there'll be 50 Republicans, at least, and 48 Democrats, counting the two independents. It won't be until the two Georgia runoffs elections are decided on January 5th that we'll know with any certainty which party will be the majority in the 117th Congress. If the Democrats win both Georgia seats, the Senate will be 50-50, and the Democrats will have control with Vice President Harris's deciding vote. If the Republicans win one or both, they will have a majority with either 51 or 52 seats. Either way, are we likely to see continued gridlock in the Senate and the Congress as a whole? I Well, I think 50-50 is a separate proposition because we've had 50-50 since I've worked in the Senate and it, right. it is not pretty. But yeah, it is, it's, it's not a comfortable situation for anyone, not least of which is that the committees are then 50-50. So right. to produce the fruit that comes yeah. to the table of the Senate, like you can't even start stuff if you're committed. Right. So 50-50, I would put aside. Yeah. But I think 5152, I would I would choose to believe is 5152 Republican with Majority Leader Mitch McConnell running the Senate as he has for many years now. I think that could be very productive. I believe that divided government is the only way for us to produce right results right now because it forces people to come to the table. Mm -hmm. There is there's no excuse not to come to the table and talk to your adversaries if. They are the only people you can negotiate with. And I, and I believe divided government could be very productive, especially with Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and President Joe Biden, because they do have such a long history and they have negotiated hard things together before. And I think um, it's possible that this could be the last election that either of these man, men will stand for. I mean, Senator 
McConnell is 78. President Biden will be 77. Right. Unclear whether they're interested in running again, either of them. They, this is a legacy moment for them. They could come together and, and really get some stuff done for the American people. And I choose to believe they will. Well, that's a hopeful note to start on. And uh, I, I certainly hope you're right about that. Um, I do want to go back to the notion of the 50-50 Senate just for a minute, because, of course, as you know, I was on the Hill uh, the last time also. And I recall very well that, I mean, of course, the Republicans had the majority with uh, Dick, Dick Cheney's vote. Uh, I remember very well that the Democrats uh, demanded a uh, uh, shared uh, control of the Senate. A, 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 a sharing agreement. And uh, of course, the minority has the leverage in the Senate because of the filibuster that it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, for the majority to organize the Senate and really begin its business unless both sides are pretty much uh, satisfied that that, that the way the Senate is going to operate is fair to both sides. So I would assume that if uh, uh, we see 50-50 again, that, that we'll see that precedent again, that Republicans will roll that out and say, look, you shared power when, uh, when we had the upper hand. This is what's fair now. Yes, and, we, and we've seen that over and over again in the Senate. I mean, past is always prologue in the Senate. So when Senator Reid right. went nuclear on the executive calendar in, in 2013, Senator McConnell followed suit with the Gorsuch nomination. If you, if you hand someone a playbook, they're going to use it. So I would assume if it's 50-50, the starting negotiations will be that 50-50 period before, although it was a different, it was a different time. I mean, it was <laughs> That's more right. Cooperative and more collaborative and less polarized at that point. And we had more moderates in the middle. So I think it'll be a tough negotiation if it's 50 50. Yeah. I hope for the country and the Senate that, that there is a bare majority one way or the other. Actually, in my notes at the end of that question, I said, or, or is it the case that the Senate is too po polarized for that to work? <laughs> Yeah, it's, right it takes now. a lot of good grace and goodwill, and grace and goodwill have been in short supply in the Senate recently. But it is interesting. I mean, about the Senate and the, uh, you know, it's it, it it's 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 for us uh, Senate nerds who are down in the weeds uh, to think about. But uh, the the Senate, when it organizes every, uh, every two years. Of course, it sets its committee ratios, for example, uh, absolutely squarely uh, at the same ratio as the Senate as a whole. Yes. And if you it's look over, if yeah. you look over at the House of Representatives, where the majority can just control things, you don't see that at all. I mean, the Rules Committee in the House is two to one plus one. You get what you get, and you don't get a. <laughs> And that is a function of the filibuster. The threat of the filibuster makes the Senate accountable to other members. And you'd like to think that the better angels are always speaking and saying, well, you should treat the other side fairly, the golden rule. Right, no, right. that's not how yeah. it works. Yeah. So the threat of the filibuster keeps them honest. Yeah, and it's basically, if you want to organize the Senate, you've got to do it in a way that's fair. Yes. And both parties know that. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, very few people understand the roles of the Secretary of the Majority and the Secretary of the Minority of the Senate. Um, Mitch McConnell uh, has called these positions the air traffic controllers of the Senate. I thought that was a very apt description. Uh, but really, uh, they are even more than that. Uh, it is the one-on-one -on -one coordination of the two, one Democrat and one Republican, that enables the Senate, which must do so much by unanimous consent, uh, to function at all. So uh, 
with that prelude, uh, how would you describe the position? So I get why people call it the air traffic controller. It's that person behind the scenes that you don't want to think about that keeps things running <laughs> and you only, they only become visible if things go very wrong. So, you know, you, Rich, you were a staffer too. The story should not be about the staff. The story should be about the bill, the member, the outcome, right. stay in the, in the background. And the two party secretaries are the ultimate background players here because they're representing the interests of the two leaders and the whole conference. So negotiating all day, every day, when is the Senate gonna convene? What are you gonna vote on? When is that vote gonna happen? Who gets to offer an amendment? When do they need to be here? Next month, when the government funding shuts down, how are we gonna put the building blocks in place to collaborate on that? It's just constant negotiation. And sometimes I say that we are like caddies <laughs> we know the course better than anybody else, but no one would ever let us play the course. <laughs> right. But yeah. Yeah. And it's super interesting because you're in you're in every room trying to figure out how to advance things, but you're not a principal. You're never a principal. Oh, and it's interesting. I mean, you describe it uh, in the way that it operates, of course, routinely day after day after day. Uh, but in those moments of great uh, heat and fire uh, in the Senate, which are become less rare, it seems, with every session, uh, it, it's really, I think, the uh, uh, Secretary of the Majority and the Secretary of the Minority, they're like the two people in the army that have the white flags and go out to the no man's land and negotiate you know, whatever it is that can be negotiated. I mean, you still have to talk to each other, even if the principals aren't doing a very good job of talking Gotta to each other. Talking. And the beauty is you negotiate the smallest things to the biggest things. <laughs> so you won't want to, you don't want to burn your bridges on the big things because the next morning you have to convene and figure out how <laughs> to get the prayer and the pledge and the babies <laughs> to fill their water. I mean, I always say that really ticking off the Democrats is like kicking a skunk. It feels really good when your foot is hitting that animal <laughs> and then you're really, really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we just, you just try not to kick right. the skunk. You try to coexist when you're angry. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's very apt. I mean, uh, I, you know, in, in the classroom when I'm describing uh, political polarization, uh, particularly as it applies to the Senate, um, my students who are here tonight will laugh at this, but I always crank my arm because I see it as a circular uh, self-reinforcing uh, mechanism that's been going on now for probably 40 years. Uh, and, it, and the polarization gets more and more extreme. And it's because it's one side kicking the skunk and then the other. Uh, you know, when the other side gets the next opportunity, they kick the other, they like, kick well, you the skunk kick back. The skunk, I'll kick the skunk and pretty soon yeah. everybody has to move out of the house because yeah. all the skunks, yes. Can't do it. Right, yeah. exactly. So that, that really leads to uh, my next question, which is re to, re to ask about this hyper-partisanship that, you know, I mean, you know, we've both been around long enough to remember when the Senate was, I don't want to, I don't want nostalgia to, you know, I'm, I don't want to turn this into Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. It got pretty rough sometimes, uh, but it was a much more civil, bipartisan, uh, collegial uh, kind of place. I think it's a little more complicated than that. So there okay. are a couple factors that I don't think people acknowledge as much. First of all, the golden days of the Senate, they talk about the, you know, the late seventies or, or whatever. It's a bunch of old men yeah, who, yeah. Like to, well, who like to drink at the end yeah. of the day. So the person in my job, um, you know, and I'm the, I'm the first mom who did it on the Republican side. And I'm, I'm the first person who didn't have a stay at home spouse to do it. So if that tells you anything about how it was before, but at the end of the day, they would unlock the bar. Everyone would get together, gather for a drink hang out, trade stories, trade 
legislation, whatever it was, less fundraising, more happy hours. Mm -hmm. So it was a bunch of old men. And then the other piece is that the seniority is different, at least on the Republican side. So the committee chairs are less durably powerful. So no one's as terrified of the committee chairs as they were. It's easy to be collegial if you're terrified that someone is going, there'll be replica repercussions for your priorities going down the line. Everybody, it was easy to keep people in line. So you give them a drink at the end of the day, you keep them scared by the committee system and the committees were so powerful, the chairs were so powerful that they could dole things out and keep people happy. Well, it doesn't work that way anymore. We have term limits on the Republican side so that you can be in the Senate. I don't know, Ron Johnson was in the Senate for four or five years, was chairman of the yeah. Homeland Security mm -hmm. Committee. Um, Shelley Moore Capito is in line to be chair of EPW next year and she's six years in. So it's started, it's starting to turn over on that side. And then there just isn't the, there, there, there's no more bar. I don't know where you'd go. I mean, you'd have to bring your own, you'd have, it'd have to be BYOB. If they wanted to have a drinks <laughs> in the cloak room at the end of the day, they would have to bring their own bottle because yeah. they just don't do it that way anymore. So it, yes, it was more collegial, but it was structured with different power centers um, that were not as inclusive. I would say not as inclusive. And sometimes being inclusive can be uncomfortable and not as productive, but being sure. inclusive is a good thing, I think. Yeah, it, uh, it, it seems as though it's at one and the same time, it's more inclusive, but also power has centralized in the leadership. In some ways, yes. Hmm. Um, in some ways, yes. but. I think power becomes more centralized in the leadership, the less productive the Senate is. Mm -hmm. So the more productive the Senate is, the less centralized the power. So it sort of goes up and down. Right. Um, for, for example, the, the reconciliation bill, the tax bill was not super centralized in the leader's offices because that was driven by the finance committee and there were individual senators who were writing different pieces of that. The house was writing it the leader decided to schedule it on the floor, had general eyes on it, but his power was definitely decentralized. The more productive that process came became, the less centralized the power was. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that as the Senate becomes more productive, there's that natural ebb and flow too. Did, did, the, uh, did that hyper-partisanship, the polarization in the body uh, as, it, as it increased, uh, did it make your job more difficult? It's wearing, honestly, it's just, it's hard to wake up in the morning and go into a building where people are really angry at each other all the time. So yeah, it, it, it gets to a point where it almost makes it easier because when it's black and white, you don't have to negotiate that much. You know, <laughs> I would like to do this, request denied. Okay, next thing. So there, there's not as much negotiation when it's super polarized and you're trying to do something that they absolutely positively don't want you to do. For example, um, the Amy Coney Barrett nomination, which I watched from the outside, mm -hmm. went extremely quickly, but it went extremely quickly because there was no negotiating to do. There was no way the Democrats were going to meet in the middle and come up with a schedule that worked for anyone. So when you don't have to consult, it doesn't take that long. Right. And the filibuster was gone. And the filibuster, <laughs> and the filibuster makes that makes things take longer, but yeah. is such a powerful tool for yeah. durable policy. It's so, and for bringing people together. It's such a powerful tool, and for keeping the process uh, fair. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's another example. We were talking about committees uh, ratios and so forth before, but. Uh, uh, well, I'll come back to this. I, I, I want to come yeah, back. Yeah, because I have a lot to yeah, say about the um, filibuster and I'm, why the minority is not just a party. Yeah. Right? Right. I want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want to hear it all too. Of course. Uh, it's not as it's not as um, burning an issue as if the Democrats were taking the Senate, and I don't think the Democrats will take the Senate. But if the Democrats had if there was the blue wave that people were predicting and the Democrats were rolling into well, it. Right. I think that's right. Uh, even, yeah. at, 
I mean, even at 50-50, it's pretty much a dead letter. I mean, I mean uh, especially with, you know, Mansion and Yeah, I saw that, right. But I did a um, podcast with our mutual friend, Bill Douster, on oh, yes. the reconciliation process last week oh. before the election. And the person who was running the podcast said, I want you to come back and talk about the filibuster. These, you know, these topics are so so important. And I was like, well, these topics are not going to be important at all because the Republicans are going to win the Senate. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I don't think they're not as, they're not as front burner as they were. Yeah. Let me just tell our audience that uh, Bill Douster was, was uh, Harry Reid's chief counsel. Uh, He was the architect of the nuclear option on, uh, and, and also the architect of pretty much every really clever procedural yeah, yeah. like yeah. he's he is um he has he defend he employs the dark arts yeah <laughs> <laughs> with a plum yes yeah a very smart guy but he and i have locked horns on the subject of the filibuster a number of times he's a worthy adversary for sure yeah. yes um so let me, uh, uh, I mean, we, t- we talked about the role of, of, uh, of, of staffers sort of staying behind the scenes and, and uh, not getting out in front of uh, principals. And I remember that well, when I, the, mo- the most shocking thing to me when I first came to Brown was the sudden realization that I could speak in my own voice again. Here I am. Right. You know, it's so After, weird. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. After all those years, uh, but I, I, I want to ask you about the leaders themselves, and and I'm, I'm not asking you to pull back the veil at all, but just uh, just for on the basis of your experience, uh, uh, when I'm asked to contrast the House and the Senate. One of the things I point to is the infrequent direct communication of the Democratic and Republican leadership uh, in the House. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, Gephardt and Gingrich at one time both testified in front of the House Rules Committee and uh, said that they had uh, talked to each other six times in four years. And uh, this contrast with the Senate in the years that I worked for George Mitchell when he was majority leader, he talked to Bob Dole six times every single day yeah. Yeah. Uh, when they were in Washington in any event, on, on the phone, on the floor, in each other's offices. It's just a, a kind of continual thing. And that's uh, for, for the reason we were pointing to before, which is that this the, the Senate, given its rules, just can't be operated without some level of cooperation from the minority. And okay. so there's this constant consult, uh, consultation. Yeah. You know, we always say for, uh, uh, I want to stop talking and let you, <laughs> and let you describe this, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I always talk about this, you know, the strong right hand of the speaker, which is the rules committee. I say this, you know, in the Senate, there are really only two things that the majority leader has, you know, that's the right to first to prior recognition and and uh, the tradition of controlling the uh, the agenda, and those two things are the majority leader's right arm, but I always add it's a pretty flabby right arm because both of those things can be countered if. Uh, if if he or she can't bring the uh, the minority le- leadership along, at least in terms of where do we go next, or what's the you know what what's the procedure going to be? Well, that, that's what uh, McConnell always, Leader McConnell always says. I'm going to get it wrong. It's like being in charge of a cemetery. You're over everyone, but they're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so where I was going with that question is, so, you know, with, without divulging any deep, dark secrets, I mean, what's the relationship like between McConnell and Schumer at this point? 
they are they are in constant contact, not mm-hmm. because they want to, but they because they I think every leader, um, the reason that the Senate, I think, does a usually a three week on one week off schedule mm-hmm. is because they need a break from each other. <laughs> because it's constant. And they may not be, you know, talking directly or picking up the phone and saying, Oh, what'd you have for dinner last night? Yeah, me too. Do you want to go see a movie? None of that. But they are constantly communicating. And some of it's through staff, but it's through staff in the same room. I mean, they're in the chamber all day long together. So there's no topic that comes up where it's not acknowledged that the views of the other leader are important and they are solicited. You don't make decisions in in a vacuum. So it's constant, constant, constant feeding that information flow back and forth between the two offices. It's very symbiotic. And it can be frustrating. It can be really frustrating. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but it is what it is. It's how the Senate works. When Mitchell first became uh, majority leader, uh, he, he went to Bob Dole's office and he said to him, I'll never lie to you and I'll never surprise you. Yes. And those were the basic things that he stuck through throughout their period uh, of uh, uh, battling with each other across the aisle. I would say that is true of McConnell and Schumer as well. Mm-hmm. Now, if they may avoid telling each other things to avoid lying to each other, <laughs> right? there, right. there are things that they don't say, <laughs> um, but they, sure. they have, you know, in the years and years and years that I've worked between the two of them, they were, they were always honest, sometimes to a fault. I mean, they can have contentious conversations. They don't pull punches with each other. Um, and then every once in a blue moon, you'll have to surprise the other side. Every, I would say every couple of years, something will happen. For example, um, when Senator Reid went nuclear on the executive calendar and on November 21st, 2013, um, he didn't tell us, mm. he didn't tell us. So, we knew that you could kind of feel there was disturbance <laughs> in the force. <laughs> and I had a, and at that point I was seven or eight weeks into the job. I was, you know, it was, oh, I was new. <laughs> I was really new. Wow. And I had, and not as much of a, a long term confidence with uh, Senator McConnell. And I had all of these pieces of paper that said, okay, if I was going to do it, I would do it this way or this way or this way or this way. And I put one on the top. I'm like, okay, here we go next to him. And they did it the way that we thought they were going to do it, but it was a surprise. And that was a real breach. I didn't, I didn't think that was the right way for Senator Reed to have handled it. Um, But that, that those things happen again, again, for the audience, uh, Laura's, what she's talking about is what popularly come to be known as the nuclear option, which was a maneuver uh, that the majority, the Democrats, when they were in the majority in this case, uh, Harry Reid was the majority leader. Uh, it was a, a, a procedural maneuver that allowed them with just a simple majority to change the way that the filibuster rule is interpreted for judicial nominations. And I'm always careful to say it that way because they didn't change the rule. Everybody likes to say they changed the rule. The rule rule says, still says three fifths duly sworn and duly elected and sworn. But, and this is the hot, this has been the hot topic for months. I mean, I don't, I don't go anywhere because of COVID. I'm stuck in my attic for some yes. <laughs> and I, when I walk down the street in my mask, um, like my neighbors will ask me about the Senate getting rid of the filibuster when the Democrats are in charge. And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about taking this 51 vote threshold to change the precedent so that it no longer requires 60 votes to right. end debate, which would be tragic. It would be a terrible oh, mistake, Rich. It would be terrible. Yeah. You and I agree. Uh, I'm the one person on this side of the aisle that you don't have to convince of that. But of course, you know, I, I get, I constantly get, you know, my inbox is full of fundraising letters, but I get them from both parties because Republicans assume that 
to have the position I have on the filibuster, I must be a like Republican. Republican. <laughs> I would just like to, to, to let your audience know, and I would assume that of all the people who are li listening to this, all 12 or 15 of them or whatever, the um, that they mostly are on the progressive side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But, you know, President Trump really wanted us to go nuclear, uh, get rid of the filibuster to fund the wall. Right. right. I mean, that's, they really wanted us to do that. And the House of Representatives controlled by the Republicans couldn't understand why we wouldn't do it because it's just a more efficient way of doing it. And you're reflecting the, right. the will of the people and we have all three branches, president, house and Senate, come on, go nuclear, build the wall. And oh. McConnell wouldn't even entertain it. I mean, I, I'm not breaking news here. He was yeah. asked about it many times. He said, we are not going to touch the filibuster. The filibuster is more important yeah. than any policy idea. He wouldn't do it. I really respected him for that. I mean, he, it wasn't easy to stand up under those circumstances. Uh, and I think, I, I, I wonder about your perspective about this. I, I think that the Democrats made a big mistake in the last few months. Uh, I don't know that the general voting public cares all that much about the filibuster, but one of the means to an end that they wanted to eliminate the filibuster for was this talk of expanding the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And people do care about that. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've said to uh, a number of my progressive friends that, uh, you know, the, ne the next time, uh, wait until you're actually in control before you start throwing those kind of ideas around, because I think it it was significant in some of the Senate races uh, where the Democrats wound up being disappointed. Well, and it was very, it was very frustrating to hear people talk about the things that they wanted to do post filibuster were really attacking the institutions of our government. And I feel like there's been so much unease with the president, the, the current president and what that means for our institutions of democracy to say, we would like him to lose, we would like to be in charge, and we are going to radically change the judicial branch. We're going to use statutory language to expand the House of Representatives and change the Electoral College. They were talking about attacking this checks and balances and the institutions of government, and that was really disturbing. There's, it, would, it didn't yeah. see, it just seemed really dissonant to me that you were trying to restore the rule of law and restore the checks and balances. But what you were talking about doing was attacking them by nuking the filibuster. Well, well really disturbing. you know, uh, to use the terms we were using before, they, they were saying, look, it's our turn to kick the skunk. Yeah. Uh, Nobody wants you know, to live in a house where every skunk has been kicked. Right. And Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's right, and we've seen it now. You know, as as I suggested, for approaching forty years, uh, of it just getting more and more and more intense. I mean, you can you can cite similar outrages on both sides over the cor over the course of that period. Yeah. Now, to be I mean, to be fair, I understand how frustrating it is to. Be, to have control of the house and pass all of these bills and they arrive in the Senate and they don't go anywhere. I understand, like they, they were frustrated. There are ways to do, there are ways to take action in the Senate and ways to be productive in the Senate that allow for the filibuster. It, it's harder, but it's possible. And I, and I think that progressive priorities, hopefully in divided government no. will get a fair hearing in the Senate next year. They will probably be moved further to the center and enacted into law and signed by the president. And that would be a gratifying next chapter for this discussion. Right. right. Yeah. And, and as you suggest, uh, in many ways, uh, you know, President uh, Biden will be benefited by the fact that he has to meet that higher threshold. Yes. Uh, because it, it, it uh, you know, the crass way to say it is it provides cover, but uh, 
in rea in reality, the, the 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 I think the right way to frame it is, you know, democracy uh, uh, assumes both parties coming to the table to negotiate, compromise, uh, come to agreements. That's another word for that is legislating. Yes, and it's more durable. If you can get a bipartisan majority for something, it's more durable. And we need some I think you're right. We can, I mean, look, we see that with, uh, you know, Social Security, Medicare, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Civil Rights Act. You yeah. know, the, you, you can go uh, down the line, the major pieces of legislation of the last century, really. Uh, in fact, many of them uh, were opposed by Republicans in the Senate initially. Uh, and they were able to force the Democrats to negotiate with them. And ultimately, what was crafted was uh, a social security system or a Medicare system, which would uh, stand the test of time. I, and the most recent example, I would say, is the criminal justice reform legislation that was, that was just recently passed. Yeah. It was very controversial on the Republican side. And they kicked it around and kicked it around and negotiated. And it ended up passing well north of 60 votes and I think it's going to be the law of the land for you know time immemorial but it was it was hard yeah. and a year before it passed well, it was not the same legislation yeah. it, they and moved then, it to the center and right. then, and yeah, then yeah. both sides can wrestle over who gets the most credit for it that's right. that's all and well it, and good but the policy gets enough, right it was like it was more like 35 35 right. and they met in the middle yeah. yeah, and the policy gets done. Yes. Uh, the the uh, you you can contrast that with the with the story of uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, and I mean, we we probably don't agree ab uh, about whether or not that's good legislation, but that's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is that it was done. Uh, by wielding a, a, a partisan supermajority. And it hasn't and, been durable. Pieces it, of it have fallen. I mean, and mandates have- Well, it can't be durable. And, durable. and it, because the, the minority is not invested in it at all. It wasn't, it, it wasn't the, their deal wasn't part of it. And so what Republicans have spent the last decade plus doing is trying to repeal it. Well, and that's another example of why the, I mean, the filibuster has saved progressives in the past. I mean, I can't tell you how many times the House Republicans sent us a Obamacare repeal bill. I don't know, maybe 28, 29 times it would arrive right. in the Senate mm -hmm. and Majority Leader Mitch McConnell would say, I'm sorry, we don't have 60 votes to do this over here. So try something right. else. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And of course, when when it finally get finally did get down to a simple majority threshold, uh, it's it still couldn't get done. Because it's even harder. It's even harder <laughs> when you're only negotiating amongst yeah, yourself. That's yeah. right. It gets even harder. Well, that that was true on the Democratic side, by the way. Even when they had the sixty votes, it just made the fifty seventh, fifty eighth, fifty ninth, and sixtieth senators the ones that yeah. had the leverage for but negotiation. But it was a Gordon Husker. Cook, yeah. kick back and the Louisiana Purchase, they nicknamed yeah, all of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, okay. Let me uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the framers put a heavy reliance on the balance of powers to hold the executive branch in check. It seems to me that to an alarming degree in a number of areas, the Congress and especially the Senate has been yielding power to the president and power lost is seldom regained. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about five in particular that I wanna to mention to you and then just sort of get your reaction. Uh, first, uh, Presidents Obama and President Trump's aggressive use of executive actions as a way to circumvent Congress. Uh, second, uh, uh, President Trump's extensive use of the Vacancy Act uh, to fill uh, cabinet posts and senior agency positions with 
acting figures who just stay acting seemingly forever and then get replaced by somebody else who's acting so that we don't, uh, it circumvents the Senate's role in, of advice and consent. Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, Trump has in a number of instances uh, frustrated the congressional oversight responsibility by uh, refusing to allow officials to testify and by uh, refusing to turn over documents that congressional committees are interested in. Uh, fourth, uh, is uh, through its unwillingness to assert its constitutional role, the Congress has virtually ceded decisions about war making to the president. And that's been going on for quite a number of years now. And then finally, it seems unlikely to me that the impeachment process is very viable going forward. Uh, simply because it's, it, I think it's amply clear that uh, irrespective of which party's president it is and so forth, that it, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just no longer a viable expectation that what you're gonna get is a fair trial in the Senate if there's an impeachment. So I'll stop yammering at you yeah, so to react to those things. I'm gonna start with the last one first. Yeah. Um, I think the die was cast on impeachment with the with the Clinton and impeachment mm -hmm. trial because it it didn't I mean it was he was Teflon that the whole proceeding was just misbegotten um, so presidential impeachment I think that ship sailed uh, during the during the Clinton impeachment yeah, trial yeah um, it was very interesting to be in the Senate during the impeachment trial. Um, not least of which to be locked in a room with all a hundred of them with no cell phones or blackberries. <laughs> yes, or right. Anything. I mean, it was right. it was super interesting, yeah. and they had, and they honestly took it took it seriously. They yes. did they did not look at their phones. They did pay attention. They did ask questions. They did grapple with some of the issues. It was impressive on both sides how attentive the Senate well, was. Well, I I can say it. You know it. it it was much the same way during the Clinton impeachment uh, without the cell phones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, although I, well, I watched it. So I was, at the, I was in the Senate, but I wasn't on the floor. My yeah. father was obviously on the floor during yeah. the Clinton impeachment. And when, but when I looked at the tapes, it was very messy. There were like papers everywhere. We ran a much tidier ship. Yeah. <laughs> we cleaned everything. Although when it was all over, we had to clean out everybody's desks because, oh man, they had so many snacks. You're not yeah. supposed to eat on the floor. Yeah, right. They're like, if we can't look at our phones, we're at least gonna have some nuts and chips yeah. and snacks. That was funny. Um, yeah, no, I think it's unfortunate that the that Congress has their their rights have been nibbled yeah. away by the executive branch, but I'm hoping that that has been temporary because as you pointed out, it was President Obama and then President Trump sort of using that same playbook. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of a tonic period yeah. where there's more of a balance. Um, definitely on the advise and consent piece, they, they should be negotiating these, these nominations, not just the cabinet, but I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of presidential appointments, including Republican slots at independent boards yeah. and agencies that are very important to the Republicans. The district judges that have blue slips and bipartisan support, that, that needs to be a collaborative process. And that I hope will reinvigorate that balance between the two of them. Well, and, and, and particularly on oversight, that once was a executive le legislative balance, irrespective of which party was controlling the, the committees and so forth. I mean, in recent Congresses, no matter you know, which way the arrow is appointing, uh, it, you know, if the, if the president's party is controlling the, the oversight hearings, uh, they tend to be pretty uh, weak gruel. And uh, if the other side is controlling them, they tend to be quite aggressive and, and sometimes even unfair. Uh, but uh, there, there was really a period in uh, in the, the in congressional history, uh, 
much of it, in which uh, the, uh, the the leadership, the, uh, the the committees in the Congress, even if they would even be uh, critical of presidents of their own party if they were overstepping the executive role and and uh, and uh, uh, you're know, going too far into legislative territory. You know? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of the famous Truman Commission, which really uh, tied into the Roosevelt administration over war profiteering. Uh, okay. No, I agree. Congress needs to reassert itself. Yeah, I'm, I, I, one final word on that. I mean, as I suggested in the question, uh, it, it uh, too often it can be sort of a one-way valve that once the power once the power shifts over it's very difficult to get it back and and they'll, but they'll need to so they'll need to do hearings for all the entire new cabinet everyone who's going to staff this administration and those will be interesting hearings too and then hopefully they'll be substantive they need to be substantive or, or these people are not going to get the votes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you know, uh, not to beat this, not to beat the same old dead horse or hobby horse, whichever, whichever you want to call it. But without the filibuster, even that leverage is quite greatly reduced. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and that was, used, that was used, a horror show of the, the Democrats who were just shocked that, that President Trump could nominate and confirm his entire team without consulting with them. He didn't have to. Well, right. And it's just like in the House where if you don't have to, you're not necessarily right. going to. Well, they, don't, they didn't have to negotiate and the nominees themselves didn't have to make a whole lot of really substantive promises with teeth in them. Yes. You know, they just avoided, they, they just completely avoided that. Whereas in the past, if a, if a nominee was being like that, well, the minority was in a position to say, look, you know, we right. can't see our way through to confirming this nomination unless you're responsive to what we're asking here. When they'll have to, the new administration is going to have to because the committees are going to be so closely divided. You're going to have to get bipartisan support in committee or that you're not even able to get to the floor. It's not possible to circumvent committee for a nomination. It's going to happen. So let me, let me just ask you about, we've been kind of uh, uh, throwing around some of the esoteric Senate roles, but- uh, Esoteric? <laughs> what, what, what's your view about rules reform? I mean, you think there's- I think- there's that, You think there's stuff that needs reform. to get done? Yeah, no, I think we need some behavior reform. Yeah, and well, we I, can, <laughs> Let's do some behavior reform and then let's figure out how to adjust the rules to, re yeah. to reward the yeah. new productivity. <laughs> Right, because well, we learn we learn the hard way over and over and over. Every time they try to reform the rules to make the Senate more efficient, I mean, Budget Act, which came up with yeah. reconciliation, mm -hmm. which has been the Hydra that ate the Senate. Um, the the Reid president in 2013 was supposed to make the Senate more efficient on noms. Well, yeah, I'm right. not sure that anybody would. I mean, yes, it's more efficient, but so I don't think we need to to change the rules. I think they need to talk to each other more and just build, do some building blocks, build, work together on some small yeah. ball stuff and keep, sure. keep building on it, make some incremental progress. Okay. They can do it. They're, yeah. all, they're all smart. No one comes to Washington to not do anything and you yeah. know, spend their life on Twitter and raising money. They don't, that's not why they're here. There are a hundred men and women who came here to make a difference. They can work together and do it. I know they can, They and they have been. And, pockets they really have well you know the one thing that i would suggest and uh, actually your dad and i wrote about it in the book uh there are some things that could could, could get done that might be 
uh, might be helpful. But, uh, you know, I think when you have a very evenly divided Senate, as you begin to approach the next election, you have, there's a window of opportunity there where you, if you could get both parties to say, you know, let, let's sit down and at least take a look if there are a few things we can do, uh, then you have a window because neither party knows whether they're going to be the majority or the minority in the next uh, Senate. At this point, the level of mistrust is so high. I, feel, I just feel like there's so many Democrats who think that Leader McConnell is just this evil genius. And if he says something that seems intuitive and efficient, it's actually this nefarious plan to somehow get four more Supreme Court justices yeah. in or whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure that the trust level on the small ball stuff is there. Yeah. It would take a lot of work. I think they should just start getting some legislation out of committee, confirming some cabinet officers, get you know, st stimulus package, infrastructure, Six months in, look around and say, okay, this is what the Senate needs to be doing. Get some COVID relief done. Then they can decide if they wanna make more changes. Let me ask you about the appropriations process a little bit. Uh, it's, it, it's, it seems to be badly broken. It did, all right, so what was it? Three years ago, I think they did seven or eight of the bills. Mm -hmm. They ended up doing full year bills. I believe that the Senate Appropriations Committee released full year bills today. They're gonna to be the basis for an om omnibus that they're gonna to try to do in December. Mm -hmm. So the committee is doing their work. Um, it's just a matter of the floor process is so wonky, mm -hmm. right? I think it would be, if, if we're doing rules changes, all right, I'm gonna go back over to the rich here over a thing. Okay. If you're doing role changes, what I would probably do is make appropriations, make it biennial. Appropriations every other year, budget every, every other year. So one year the Senate's doing the budget, the next year they're doing appropriation spells back and forth and back and forth because otherwise you're just, you don't have enough time to do everything you're supposed to be doing. So if you can yeah. spend six months on appropriations every other year, yeah. that would be a decent, rules change and I think it would be efficient. It yeah. doesn't get rid of the rights of the minority. Yeah, I, think, I right. think you're right. I think it's 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 a great idea. There's lots of support for it. If I'm not mistaken, they, they even got it out of committee a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, What's a Domenici idea? It's been around forever. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the big pro I don't have to tell you, but just the, you know, the big problem is that the appropriators as we call the people who sit on the appropriations committee, they are very powerful and they don't, I mean, they like having their leverage every year, not every two years. Yeah. But I think they're, I think they're getting there on this one because they've yeah. got to be exhausted. They're constantly having to produce enormous appropriations packages yeah. that never get passed. I think they, I think they might be sold on the every other year plan now. Yeah. Oh, uh, or you could do, you know, yeah. half and half. You could have six one year and six the next year and consolidate them. But yeah, I agree. The appropriations process is really unwieldy. And it's in, and at the end of the day, it's written by the leaders. Like those big packages are written by the leaders and that's tough on the rank and file members. Well, let me, uh, let me turn to the audience questions for, uh, just a minute and see what, what we've got for you here. Uh, uh, Christopher asks, why do independents have to caucus with one of the parties? Do you think this will change? Ah, that's a good question, Christopher. Um, independents don't have to caucus with one of the parties, but if they don't, they don't get committee assignments. <laughs> so right. you want committee assignments. Which is a little like saying you don't have to eat if you don't want to, but you're not going to yeah. live very long. When we had a freshman senator, I ha I worked on committee assignments with Leader McConnell. It's one of the things I did. Yeah. We had a senator at one point in the, in the recent future who told me that he didn't want committee assignments. He thought they were a waste of time. And I was like, well, we'll we won't finish until you come back to us because I bet you change your mind. And he did. Yeah. Right? They do. They're a huge, no they're a huge yeah. time investment. And sometimes it feels like a waste of time, but yeah. It, so independents have to choose. They have to choose. And the two parties also have lunch together. 
Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday right. now. So if you're if you're not caucusing with one of them, I guess you're eating by yourself in the cafeteria, eating with the pages. But you have to pick a team to eat lunch with and 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 get your committee assignments. Well, yeah, and. And not to mention that one of the independents came pretty close to being the party's nominee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had a lot. I mean, the, the Senate's always had one or two. Yeah. Well, I remember, you know, Wayne Morse did move his desk into the center aisle. Uh, now, Which we can't now do now because we're ADA compliant. We have ramps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a guy who he, he served in the Senate as a Republican, as a Democrat, and as an independent sitting in the, in the middle aisle. Yes. Okay, uh, Alana asks, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the current reporting of, uh, 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 about Republican senators, except Romney, being quiet about uh, President Trump while congratulating Biden behind closed doors. Is that better than the public infighting we see among Democrats in the House? Well, so I'm not behind the closed doors anymore. So yeah. I'm just reading the coverage that you all are reading. Right. Um, I think they're just giving it some time, right? This, it's, it, I, would, I believe that it's all gonna sort itself out and um, congratulations will happen and yeah. Maybe not from the president. Yeah, but 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 just giving it other away. Republicans will get there. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, do. I mean, I think it 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 is a familiar kind of uh, Senate reaction to when there is this kind of uh, 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 explosion. There's this kind of heat. It's kind of a familiar thing in the Senate to say, well, you know, let's, let's, let's oh take God. some time here, or, you know. The uh, Senate is really I, good I at taking its time. Yeah. <laughs> They're yeah, really good at taking their yeah. time. You know, Mitch McConnell was saying, well, you know, we haven't counted the electoral votes yet. Oh, and he said, and I think what he said, if you read what he said, he's, yeah. he said, the president has every right to make these challenges. They're going to work their way through the courts. That's how democracy works, which is which is right. Tends to be true. Uh, yeah. Which is a different question about, you know, what is the right thing for a presidential candidate to do when it's clear that they've lost an election? I mean, uh, then you need yeah. to ask the presidential candidate. Yeah. No, that's right. That's right. Yep. Uh, Matthew asks. What do you think about uh, Senator McConnell and folks like Lindsey Graham saying we shouldn't confirm a nominee in a presidential year and then ramming a nominee, nominee through the Senate eight days before an election? You knew this one would come. Yes. So I would say I've had, I've had a number of conversations with people over the last week or so about what the Biden-McConnell relationship is going to look like and where they can find common ground. And I would say as long as they can stay away <laughs> from the judicial wars, yes. right? It's like that dress that was so big on the internet a few years ago where it was either blue or brown and, and the blue people didn't see the brown and the brown people didn't see the blue. Like they're never gonna see eye to eye on the judicial wars and people who are angry about Merrick Garland are never not gonna be angry about Merrick Garland and we should just agree to disagree. There is no common ground here. Yeah, that's right. And, and, to, and to touch the familiar theme just one more time, uh, the absence of the filibuster makes it worse. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it just, it takes away, it's, there are no brake pads on right. the car anymore. The brake right. pads are gone. We are, right. you know, we are metal e on metal. Right. Either in the Senate or really uh, in terms of the president's, uh, the choices that the president uh, makes for the nomination. The, the president no longer has to consider uh, the opposition party in the Senate because they're no longer relevant. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm assuming that President Biden will be president for four years and Majority Leader McConnell will be Majority Leader, hopefully for four years. And, and at that point, they will work together on 
a Supreme Court nominee in a professional and collaborative way. <laughs> because it wasn't like it, they, they did before. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I worked on nominations with with Senator McConnell when, when the President Obama was the president and we confirmed hundreds of his nominees and several Supreme Court picks. Yeah. So and, well, and the president and Leader McConnell, I don't you you recall this, um, Rich. I'm not sure if other people on the line recall this, but during the DACA, the undocumented immigration executive order, the initial kerfuffle and all the flare up, um, President Obama nominated Loretta Lynch to be the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. And she was pretty controversial. And McConnell was the majority leader of the Senate. He not only put her nomination on the floor, he filed cloture on her nomination, signed the petition, sent it, like scheduled it, and voted for it. Yeah. Because he believed that President Obama deserved to have qualified people confirmed if he was gonna put them up. And Loretta Lynch was really controversial at that point. And McConnell said, sorry, I'm in charge of the Senate. He's the president. He picked someone. She's obviously qualified, even if lots of people think she's controversial next and he did it so that, yeah that's a long honored tradition in the senate also many senators i mean it's it's one unfortunately it's one of the things that's eroding along with a lot of other stuff with you know with with this kind of corrosive polarization hyperpartisanship wearing at it but it 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 for for as long as I can remember, many senators, I, the majority, most senators, in fact, felt that uh, uh, you know a president was entitled to the to their not the people they wanted in their government, unless there was a really substantive disqualifying reason, disqualifying issue, disqualifying reason, right? I don't. I mean, I always find it much easier to skip a meal when my fridge is full. So when senators have a lot of leverage and they know right. what they can do, sometimes they choose not to do it. Right. But if you take away all their leverage and they're scrambling right. sure. to make their voice heard, it becomes ugly. And that's what- Well, well all you have to do to, to demonstrate that is go, you know, go look at the roll call votes on confirming nominees to the cabinet for the last 40 years or so. And then, uh, you know, take, Take a look at what is what it has looked like once the filibuster was gone. It became shirts and skins overnight. Yeah, and and so you know it's now a routine thing to see uh, a, uh, a nominee with uh, 45, 46, 47 no votes, and which would have been just I'm shocking, thinking. just shocking, you know. Uh, before, I mean, it was it, it it was a pretty embarrassing thing for a nominee if they got twelve or thirteen or fourteen no votes. Most of them were unanimous or close to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the reason for for ju just the reason you're talking about, which is that you know the the belief that uh, a president was entitled to uh, to uh, their choice and. And by the way, there were also always many senators who took the position on Supreme Court nominations that uh, even when they opposed the nominee, they would vote for cloture in order to- uh, We didn't have cloture on Supreme Court. Right, right. Clarence Thomas was confirmed with 52 votes. There was sure, no- That's right. No one fill. I mean, right. filibustering Supreme Court nominations is recent. Right, that's right. But but you know, one of the things that contributed to the fact that it it wasn't used in that way was that uh, many of the senators, even those that opposed a judicial nomination, uh, took the view that that the president was at least entitled to an up or down vote. Yeah. on a nomination. Yes. So the judicial wars are, have heated up since the early 90s and have gone downhill fast. But before that, this it was not a thing like this. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Chris, Christopher's back with a follow-on to his earlier que question about- Another excellent uh, question yeah. from Christopher, yes. yes. Uh, if there's time to ask, uh, he says, uh, can you explain why they uh, have to be part of the parties to get on committees? Here, he was talking, his question was the one about independence. Well, because the way the committee structure the way the committees are structured in the rules, it's majority and minority. So you either have to choose to be in the majority or the minority. So I guess if we had some kind of coalition government in there, you could have the majority parties and yeah. the minority parties. Right. But, but the Senate rules are structured majority, minority. Yeah. And, and if you Yeah. And that comes to my point too. And people are talking about the filibuster and how it's the minority party is filibustering. I mean, Rich, you know better than anybody on the planet that the minority is not always a party affiliation. It can be regional, it could be gender, it could be, you know, I live in Nevada and I don't want nuclear waste coming to my state. You like minorities have been different and coalitions that have mounted filibusters have been not necessarily party affiliations. So the party system in the Senate, I would say is very strong now, but it hasn't always been. And who knows if it's gonna stay this way. But right now, Christopher, you're right. If you are not Republican or Democrat, you have to pretend to be a Republican or Democrat because you, you can't do anything in the Senate. Because if you're insisting on being an independent apart from the parties, what you're saying to the leader of each party is I'm not gonna help you get into the majority. Yeah. And so why should they help you get onto a committee? Yes. Yes. Although we don't have, so that house has this very pernicious system where they, the entire house elects the speaker. And this is what happened to speaker Boehner. And this is why there's always this kerfuffle at the beginning of the Congress and Pelosi's trying to promise things to the moderates to whatever, because the entire house votes on it. So your, your minority is never going to vote for the speaker. Right. So she's trying to eke out this vote. We don't have that in the Senate. And the majority leader is not an elected post. And we've talked over the years about changing how leadership works in the Senate and maybe the majority leader should be elected, but always came back to the fact that we don't want a system like the House. You do not want the majority leader running scared um, and, and having to scramble at the beginning of every Congress. The Senate does not need to operate like that. And I wish that the House, they've, and they've talked about it over the years, I wish the House would change that because I think it's unseemly and unproductive that they do it that way. Because it's not, I mean, this, the vacating the chair for the speaker, I mean, just, you, you can't lead if, you're lead if you've got a gun to your head the whole time. Which is what, and yeah. this is what happened to Speaker Boehner and they, and they ousted him and it was, was not good. It was not good for him. It was not good for the party. It was not good for America, the way that worked. But we don't do that. We don't do it like that. Yeah. It, <laughs> another way we're different from the house. It's another, it's another one of the traditions that's really eroded in this hyper-partisan era. I mean, you know, it used to be that uh, speakers uh, thought very much took seriously the fact that they wore two hats, that they they stood as the speaker of the house, you know, kind of like the Queen of England, the ceremonial uh, person who rose above the house and rep represented its interests. Uh, and then the second hat was leader of the majority party in the in the House of Representatives, well, uh, those those two hats are really just they're the same. They're the same hat, yeah. right? Yeah, right. they're the same hat. Uh, let me see. Uh, Franklin asks, would the Senate be willing to make substantial changes towards bipartisanship if said changes were unpopular among their constituents? Well, okay, so the Senate is structured to be a little bit more removed from the electorate. I mean, that's so there's it's six year terms, unlike the House, we all know this, the House is two year terms, Senate is six year terms, we've only been directly 
you know, elected for a hundred years. So not, I mean, not, not even that long. Um, and, you know, senators represent an entire state. So, I mean, California has everything under the sun. So I think it's easier for them to be insulated from, from strong opinions at home. I don't think any senator is going to refuse to represent their constituents, but I do think they're a little more insulated from that direct being on the ballot every two years. They can make decisions that are more national. So I, yeah, I think the answer is yes. I guess an example of that is um, the immigration bill. So people call it the gang of eight immigration, but the Senate passed a comprehensive middle of the road immigration proposal that just got torn to pieces in the house. Um, and it was middle of the road. I mean, it was McCain and, and Rubio and I don't remember who the other eight were, but it was bipartisan and it was moderate. And it was senators taking a, a broader view of what needed to happen in, to the immigration system. And then it promptly dying on the shoals of the house. So I think the answer to your question is yes. I don't know that I would word it that way I mean, I don't know that I would word it exactly that way, but I do believe senators have a more national perspective frequently. Okay, we now have an entire gang former, forming, formulating around Christopher, They're fascinated with these questions about the independence. So <laughs> Matthew says- Everybody loves Bernie. My, I, have an, <laughs> I have an 18 year old son who loves Bernie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so Matthew says, uh, sorry, sorry to add on to that, but can a party reject an independent from joining their caucus? Oh, yes. Yes. So there are, so conferences, so I don't know exactly what the Democrat conference rules are, although they're su substantially similar, but each, the Republican conference has its own rules and you talk about it talks about what to do if you're if you're going to expel a member, expend, uh, censure a member, how committee assignments work. There are um, the Republicans have a specific action that they take if a member is indicted. The Democrats don't have that, although I think it's unspoken. Yeah, so there are ways for the conferences to police their own. And um, actually, this was an actual real life question. The issue didn't get joined, but I know that we would have joined this issue had Roy Moore been elected to the Senate right. in Alabama, from Alabama. Right. Because, you know, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, Okay, let, let me ask you, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm often asked by Brown students, and, and I, I like to ask this of uh, all of our uh, uh, guests who have had very distinguished careers. Uh, I'm often asked by Brown students how I got to Capitol Hill and how they can work in the Congress. Can you share the story of how you landed there and what your advice is to a student who would like to work on Capitol Hill? I love this question. I'm so glad you asked me this question. <laughs> um, first of all, I hate to break this to you, Professor Ehrenberg, but I've never taken a political science class <laughs> ever. Um, so I, my undergraduate degree was in music performance and I have a master's wow. in American literature. I studied Faulkner, both of which have fed my soul and been completely not useful to me in my job. So that being said, pol political science, I'm sure is useful. Uh, it's, it's not useful for me. <laughs> um, but I, so I arrived in, in Capitol Hill when I was in, I was 14 years old, but I have an identical twin sister. So yes. my father was the Senate's parliamentarian when we were coming to be Senate pages and we both wanted to do it. So the Senate parliamentarian is a nonpartisan role and they take that very seriously. 
My father um, is so nonpartisan that he was fired by both the Republicans and the Democrats, which people always think is funny. And then it makes me really sad. So I don't actually think it's that funny because it was but, really terrible. But your dad, about. your dad is very he proud of it about it because he believes that it demonstrates how nonpartisan he was. He was nonpartisan and he ticked everybody off on both sides. So when we were in high school, my sister and I were in high school, we both wanted to be pages. So he said, okay, well, we got to have one of each. So you, Laura, will be the Republican page and you, Carrie, will be the Democratic page. And there we are. So I'm still on the Republican side and my sister works at NPR. So I would say she's still on the Democrat side <laughs> and we split. Um, which was funny. So I arrived as a page and I loved it. I loved it so much. I just didn't want to do anything else except work in that chamber for the rest of my life. And the job that I wanted was secretary for the majority. Actually, the job I wanted was assistant secretary for the majority because it's a way better job than the top <laughs> one. Like it was one of, I always wanted to be Robin. I didn't need to be Batman. So, and I actually enjoyed being Robin more than being Batman, but it's okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so I arrived in, in high school and I ended up dropping out of high school because I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to work in the Senate Republican cloakroom. So the secretary for the majority at the time was a man named Howard Green. And he told me I could stay. So at the age of 17, I started working in the cloakroom. And I worked there for a couple of years. And then my mother said, I really want you to go to college. <laughs> so I did. Um, and I went off to college and studied heart performance. And I came right back to the Republican cloakroom working in the same desk and the same chair that I had left four years ago, four years before. And I just worked my way up till I got to my dream job of being secretary for the majority, which was the absolute privilege of a lifetime. I just loved it. Absolutely loved it and was very sad to leave. I left at the end of February of this year after almost, you know, 30 years of Senate service. And um, I left because, well, first of all, it was time. I have two teenagers and I needed to see them at some point. <laughs> like, and, the, and then the universe said, that's great. We're going to lock you in your house with them for seven months. So, we, you know, a lot of <laughs> um, but I, it was hard to leave, but I was very mindful and Rich, you know this, there are a lot of people on the Hill who do not leave on their own terms. Your boss doesn't right. win election or gets caught in a sex scandal or, you know, whatever. And people don't leave on their own terms and they leave sort of quietly out the back door or in whatever. My father left, you know, 36 years of Senate service without even a watch, a gold mm -hmm. watch. So I left, I had all the kerfuffle, like sell, it was amazing. I walked out the door, it was, I was leaving on my own terms and it was a real gift. I would say, come work on the Hill when you're really young and really cheap because the hardest job to get on the Hill is when you're fresh out of law school and you've got loans and there's a firm that wants to pay you $200,000. <laughs> yeah. And you know, there's a Senator's office that says, well, I could hire you to be a legislative correspondent for $38,000, but you're overqualified, right? There's just, it's hard to come in later. So come in when you're, you know, come intern, they're all paid now, which is an excellent development. That's very recent. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was not great that the only people who could intern were people who had enough money to support themselves. That was not okay. We always pay, I always paid my interns. Um, go intern, go start when you're young and then just work really hard and do whatever gets thrown at you because 30 years later, people remember if you're, if you are a hard worker and you ask a bunch of questions, you're gonna fit right in on the hill and you'll develop relationships that will be important to you 10, 20, 30 years. And it's super neat. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's a great place to work. It's really awesome. It gets into your blood. Yep. <laughs> it does. You know, it's what we call Potomac fever and it's a real thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's weird and arcane and yeah. backward, but it's wonderful. Yeah. And I, and, and I always love the Capitol building itself. It has that weird like dusty smell too. You walk into it and you're like, oh, it's the capital smell. It's like a whole bunch of old like pigs in a blanket and a bunch of dust. 
in that building? One of the courses I teach is the, is the US Congress. And uh, every semester I teach it, the last, uh, the last lecture is on the architecture of, this, of the Capitol building. Neat. Uh, you know, based on, I think it was Winston Churchill who said, we build our buildings and then they build us. I did a project in grad school on the depictment of uh, George Washington in the building and what it meant about American society at the time. Like, cause it, it was after like during the uh, civil war is when they did the apotheosis and they were trying to say all's right with the world. Our God, George Washington is here. They had founding fathers and inventors because it was during the industrial revolution, that whole machine in the garden piece. Like it's fascinating cultural snapshot of like 1850 to 1860. Yeah, yeah I love that building. Yeah. Although, you know, we divided it up because the house and Senate never do anything collaboratively. So the Senate side had Constantino Bermidi, right. all exactly. of our frescoes, and then the House side bought American. I don't even know what they did, but it's like yeah. not not great. Come to the Senate side; well, it's not much nicer. Well, what they did is they turned up their nose at all that fancy stuff in the Senate, well, and then now they all want to <laughs> come. Now up. they all now they all yeah. yeah, that's right. When their constituents come, they take them for tours through the Senate side. Yeah, so they've got that weird little whispering spot in Statuary Hall, but that's it. It's the only highlight on the house side. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, let just uh, before we let you go, uh, is there anything that I, that we haven't asked you about that you were hoping you get the chance to say? Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I I talked about public service. I talked yeah. about how nuking the filibuster would kill our democratic institutions. I said, thank you, Rich, for yeah. inviting me. I think I hit it all. Well, thank you so much for uh, for doing this, for coming and spending time. This has really been a wonderful, uh, it, it's been a wonderful conversation. I, I, I would like to do it for the next three hours or so, but I would wear you out and our audience as well. But Yeah, so next time we'll do it in, in Providence. I would love that. Well, sure.